All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Tools and Techniques Securing APIs in Kubernetes Environment. I'm Chris Jens, CNCF Ambassador Technologist for Cloud Native um, as a self-employed person, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Ivan Novikov, CEO at WallArm out of San Francisco. Um, just as a few housekeeping items, um, before we get started during the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee, um, but there is a Q&A button um, at the bottom of the screen. So you go to pretty much chat and then there will be Q&A. You put in your questions there. Please don't put them in the chat as we might lose them, but um, put them into the Q&A box and I will read them to Ivan whenever we do Q&A sessions during the webinar. Um, this session will be recorded, so you will be able to find it on the CNCF website um, probably later today. Um, and by this, let's kick it off and enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Ivan. I'm the CEO and of Worm. I do application security and also I'm a bug hunter and a whitehead hacker, which means that I'm a practical uh, expert and application security and today I'd like to uh, share some sort of experience and uh, like application security related aspects of Kubernetes environments. So let's start with this. So I want to actually explain seven, not six. I don't know why I put six here, never mind. So um, six, uh, I mean seven points we need to take to build uh, secure environment in Kubernetes. In particular, uh, we need to protect our data, right? So in the data that should be perceived by apps and we need to protect the entire environment and then take care about the application security, which is the most important part here because as you know, so every single time when we are talking about data breach or some sort of like security incidents, we uh, need to focus on this entry point, that initial, uh, initial like issue or initial vulnerability that was used by a taker. But I want to present everything in this direction to explain how to secure and how to build a security environment uh, in Kubernetes itself. And then to explain how attackers actually may use that issues and uh, how they can actually steal data because of like application security issues there. So let's start with uh, namespaces. So first of all, I need to explain why uh, we need to build everything and specifically this direction. So uh, we need to remember that we want to protect our data, like data of our customers, uh, I don't know, our orders, they are like last and first names, emails, whatever, SSNs, never mind which kind of data. We cannot protect environments, apps, like service, something else. We need to protect exactly data. That's why uh, we need to figure out how uh, like which kind of data we need to put uh, where, how to operate with this data before we will try to isolate, secure, change. It's actually the same approach uh, was built like years ago when uh, like people just started to build like uh, access control lists for networks or um, like other isolation things there. We need to start with the data all the time. For example, if I have like a pet ties uh, online shop, I need to take care about my user data. Uh, there's like pets data, some sort of like kind breed, date of birth of my pet, whatever. Uh, cards itself, some sort of like current state of orders, items in their prices, and some sort of marketing things like banners, clicks, I don't know, webinars, whatever. So, and if I'll take a look at my data, so it will be a little bit more clear for me how to divide everything by that kind of data and how to build uh, everything around that. It is related to this like microservices approach uh, and like decentralized functions approach as well, but we need to understand that service is kind of function and data is kind of like <laughs> the data behind that function. That's why we need to uh, divide everything by data first where, before we will uh, um, answer to a question how to uh, like proceed the data by different functions. So it's kind of like a basic concept, but for some reason, uh, for some reason, um, P 
people uh, actually avoiding that all the time. So I'm uh, making mistakes. So as I said before, data is everything. Uh, and in best practice case, we can actually split everything by some sort of like data domains or data kinds, like personal data, all this data, whatever. But the real world is different. So, and we will build on real apps. Uh, I mean, in particular, it means that when we are solving some sort of like business problem, right? So we want to sell this, uh, I mean, pet toys or whatever it means. Uh, when we talking about that, we all the time will be faced with real kernel cases. And it could be like some sort of like caching things like memcached or ready stores that need to part everything because we need to make our operation faster. It means that we need to combine every single like piece of the data somehow for some period of time and some sort of temporary storage. And it means that we will break our isolation there. It's a kind of like uh, exceptions there and we need to take care about that as well. Plus uh, we will do temporary files, different storages, different log files, journals, whatever. It's also some sort of like exceptions of that and we cannot divide just data by kinds, but we need to think about that and we need to build our environment based on that fact. So otherwise, uh, anyways, we will never build anything better than uh, like <laughs> random, random isolation so architecture. So plus we have a front end service and in particular it means that if somebody will able to uh, find like a client side back, back in your application and exploit that back so that person will be able to take an access to all the data because technically the website will take all the data, login, passwords, I don't know, like uh, everything else uh, there. It's also a kind of like an exception from that like ideal world when all the data could be isolated between like different logic, logical parts. But we need to think about that and we need to try to divide everything uh, at specifically at data layer. So let's start with namespaces. Uh, as I said before, we will uh, pass through the seven stages and we need to do it in specifically this direction because everything uh, we will describe later, almost everything there will be based on some sort of like um, previous steps, right? So idea of namespaces in Kubernetes, it's, it's pretty like um, usual thing. I believe that you heard about that already uh, an idea here is to divide cluster to a few virtual clusters. So if you are in a tech for a while, it seems like virtual hosts for under the uh, roof of like, under the hood of like one uh, main host. So as it was, was like hosting providers for like 25 years ago, the same idea, uh, but applied to uh, clusters, Kubernetes clusters, how to split them by virtual clusters. And one useful quote from, from official Kubernetes docs, I need to mention here as, uh, so Kubernetes does not provide a mechanism to enforce security across namespaces. You should do that by yourself, it means. And you should only use that within trusted domains and not use when you need to be able to provide guarantees that the user of the cluster or port uh, be enabled to access any of other namespaces. Uh, resources. So you, it means that this is kind of like logical uh, uh, thing, right? So you can apply namespaces to do something else based on that isolation, network security, whatever it means. That's why we we'll need to start specifically from namespaces before we do role-based networks, but whatever. So, uh, and point number two, uh, what is really unique about that and what is bad actually about these namespaces, namespaces just kind of list. You cannot create a hierarchy of that. You cannot put one namespace as a, a child of other namespace, a parent namespace. You probably want to do that, but you cannot. But we can do some hacks and actually it's pretty usual hacks implemented by almost everybody who builds production ready environments based on uh, Cube. So, uh, and the hack here is we can use some sort of prefixes. We can define our own schema, like name schema, how to build, um, uh, how, how to define namespaces in our own way and use that to actually put different attributes there. So for example, it could be team name and environment name and uh, all something like that. But since I already suggested to use this like database approach, we can also put a kind of data inside that uh, namespace name and then like split it by 
dash or uh, it's impossible to use dash by, by minus uh, character or other characters we can use there. So, uh, for example, I want to suggest to use this first datum uh, minus staging, for example, to define a namespace that specifically address uh, all the personal data at staging environment or like PCI DSS related data at production environment. So it can help us later to build everything based on that and to apply access controls, to apply different policies based on that. And technically it means that uh, we're doing attributes, right? So uh, kind of data is an attribute there. Uh, environment name is a kind of attribute there. We can add more attributes, uh, adding this added that here uh, by the same thing, right? And it means that, uh, so technically it means that uh, we want to build uh, a kind of like basis to apply as a mechanism based on some sort of attributes. And this is an interesting fact there. I'll explain, I'll, uh, explain later uh, what exactly we can build based on that. So a couple of links you can use to understand that things better and actually uh, I want to give you as many like receipts as I only can. So, I mean, valuable receipts we can use out of the box to build that. This is really link you can use to uh, understand better how to work with namespaces, how to define the namespaces and different use cases and insights uh, from, from Google actually. So if you have any questions related to namespaces and specifically that idea to put that prefixes, let's, let's discuss that and then we will switch to a uh, role-based model. Do you have any questions there? Doesn't look like cool. there are any questions. Which is good, which is good. So, uh, I mean, it's the usual thing there, right? So, so I believe that when you just want to start with to work with Kubernetes, you just need to go through that. So second one is a role-based model. So uh, what we uh, did before with the namespaces, we technically uh, mentioned that attributes based thing, right? So, and, but uh, we want to uh, explain a role based model, not attributes based model, because as we can uh, see at a Google official site and Kubernetes doc, ABC, which means like attribute based SS control is a powerful concept. However, as implemented in Kubernetes, ABC is difficult to manage and understand. It requires an SSH and root file access to a master of VM of the cluster to make authorization policy changes. And so it's, uh, and for permission changes to take effect, the cluster API must be restarted, which is uh, like non useful way. That's why when we're uh, talking about like our role based access control, when we're talking about like access control, we're talking about like RBC instead of ABC. But what we actually did here, we put some sort of attributes, right, and namespaces. And nowadays we can use the same thing to apply some sort of like attributes uh, in RBC. So we did that specifically to bypass that like use less ABC model in Kubernetes. So Let's proceed then. The core idea is it's a whitelist only. It means that everything that we never listed will be denied. So it's based on three things, subject, resource, and operation. So subject, it's like who, like developer, DevOps, I don't know, uh, team member, user, process, whatever. Resource as like with which kind of object, like pod or service or cluster itself. Or, or other logic instances related to Kubernetes and operations there means like which kind of action we want to allow to do. It's technically related to REST method. It could be like uh, with you or like modifications there, list, whatever. So, and a cluster role is additional uh, object here. Everything actually related to your BC based on two uh, main uh, objects. It's a role plus cluster role. Um, we described role before and cluster role is the same as role plus it allows you to give permissions for additional things like non namespace resources like nodes uh, that we can actually avoid to do because everything there should be covered by namespaces. Uh, I mean everything uh, we made with Kubernetes resources and all the namespaces of a cluster we need to avoid that as well. Uh, never try to allow somebody to deal with all the namespaces because uh, 
when you will do this wildcard, one day if somebody will make a mistake and create another one namespace outside of the thing, I'll cover that case later. So the particular person will take an access on that as well. It shouldn't be there. Just list only that namespaces you want to uh, create and avoid everything there. So, and non-resource things like built-in endpoints such as health or other things there, which is definitely useful for DevOps and operation guys. So it's a main idea, I guess, that you know that. So how to implement that to our uh, ABEC concept? So actually the hack here is uh, to, as I said before, to uh, build some sort of like attribute-based uh, controls uh, using that RBC role-based uh, concept of Kubernetes. We can use that by namespaces. For example, uh, we can use that context here and define some sort of security con uh, con context <coughs> uh, and a use space and a namespace like uh, post data minus prod and define a user post data prod minus reader and it means that that particular user will be able to read uh, personal data uh, at production um, and so we we can take care about that privileges and in this case we'll, it will be pretty understandable it will be pretty visible for us and for all the other folks of our team plus it will be related to specific context uh, and we can use the same context to apply different like access controls like network security for example or pod security uh, based on that so that's why i want to explain that case uh, as as actually as a reference design of everything we built before and Kubernetes in our own company. But if you know how to, uh, I mean, extend that, so just let me know. Plus, uh, once again, you can add as many attributes there as you want to explain namespaces better and to then build like this attribute-based access controls better than in this simple case. So if we have any questions related to role-based model, just let me know. And here you can find uh, a couple of links related to uh, role-based thing. thing from the. I'm sorry. Uh, there again? is some question even sure. from before that was um, how do you enforce namespace rules? I think parts are actually answered already, but if you want to elaborate on that a little. Uh, let me open the question. I I'm not sure that I have you. It is how do you enforce namespace rules? I got it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'll cover that later. We need to enforce not only namespaces policies to, uh, but also uh, all the other things we need to do there because Kubernetes in this case is just kind of framework and you can build everything based on this framework. And uh, a little bit later I'll explain, I have an additional slide, a special slide to explain how we can keep everything uh, under control and enforce everything there. So we can use open source tools. And so I'll explain a couple of them uh, at the last part of, of my webinar today. So I'll cover that later. It's not related only for namespaces enforcement and also related to ever since the rest, like role based as well, right? So you need to enforce that first data prod reader like uh, notation, right? So you cannot avoid that. You, you can define ever since here, like you can make a mistake here and, and type like, press data instead of pers data, right? It shouldn't be there. So I'll explain a little bit later how to how to control that. Once again, Kubernetes is not, uh, in, in terms of like this application security, Kubernetes is a kind of framework and you need to build everything there based on your own experience and concept. And here, I'm here actually to explain uh, actually my concept and my experience, how it's possible. I'll, I'll cover that enforcement a little bit later. Anything else? Um, yes, there is one question from Adele, um, which is how does Kubernetes become aware of specific uses or groups created outside of it? Mm. Let me check the question there. Um. So uh, if I understand that, like um, in the right way, so we just, 
so and again, Kubernetes is a kind of like framework here. So you can define uh, everything based on this like role-based model and Kubernetes will uh, just implement everything that we will define. So if you want to uh, like avoid something or I don't know, like provide uh, any more um, things there, you can define that uh, at that YAML files and Kubernetes will implement that. So Kubernetes itself will not do anything related to, 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 to your roles, right? So uh, you can define uh, your own roles and so Kubernetes will take care of it. That's it. So there is nothing uh, that Kubernetes can do out of the box without like your efforts here. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, he just rephrased like, I mean, how does roles get associated with specific users or groups in RBAC? So how to associate user X to group Y in RBAC? So it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's not associated anyhow. So we need to create that association. So that's why we're using that. So we, we want to uh, create, so we can create actually our own notation here to associate that. And then we need to define uh, all the context that to, to, to create those links. So it's, it's a kind of hack how, how we can associate that. Okay, and that's it. Okay, so let's proceed with network policies then. So uh, a couple of quotes as usual from, from Kubernetes official docs. So quote number one, that by default, pods are not isolated. So it means that they traffic, uh, they accept traffic from any source. So, and second quote here is like, only uh, on there is a network policy in the namespace selecting a particular pod, that pod will reject any connection that are not allowed by network policy, which is good. So it means that if you would just start to uh, declare network policy, you can be sure that everything the rest will be rejected. So you don't uh, need to take care of it. So it means uh, in particular that other parts in the namespace uh, that are not selected by network policy will continue to accept the traffic. So it means uh, for us that we need to uh, apply network policy to cover everything. If we will miss something, so uh, that parts will accept any connections, which is bad for us. And once again, to guarantee that we covered everything by network policy, we need to implement some sort of enforcement there. And to do that, we need to use some sort of tools. That's only one way how we can do that. In particular, it means that we need to apply some sort of like uh, filters uh, to, to our YAML files, config files there, and check that. So that's only one way how we can enforce anything in Kubernetes. But a little bit later, I explain with, with which kind of tools we can do that. So uh, plus we need, to ma uh, we need to remember that we need to disable metadata, like API metadata. It's technically ETCD provided by Azure, GCP or AWS access from all the pods to prevent local exploitations through server side issues. It could be like a necessary app, it could be a remote cut execution issues or whatever. So it's a lot of issues um, at application security level that allows uh, attacker to send requests to internet may also affect that thing. That's why we need to uh, disable the access. So in point number two, uh, we shouldn't forget to restrict access to uh, Kubernetes services like dashboard control panels and others. And so uh, a little bit later, uh, actually right now, I want to explain two different cases, two different studies that happen with companies who miss that. So third number one is related to Shopify. So in that particular case, actually uh, one folk uh, at uh, HackerOne, so which is a kind of like a platform uh, that allows bug bounders to send uh, vulnerability reports to vendors and achieve some sort of like compensation for that from them. So he create a store at Shopify, uh, his own store, and then modified template and add some, some sort of JavaScript there um, to open a new window at server side. So and again, that, that file actually uh, rendered at server side, not on the browser, and put a metadata API there and achieve back 
some sort of results from, uh, from Kubernetes cluster of Shopify. And he used that to, to steal their uh, keys and uh, credentials tokens from a cluster itself and in effect compromise the entire cluster. So in particular, it means that he was able to run any code uh, with the root privileges at each single pod at every single uh, instance there, uh, which is definitely a bad thing, just by using that SSRF attack. Uh, and so everything there was based on this application security things. Definitely, so you need to take care about this metadata API if you're using uh, Kubernetes at Google Cloud or AWS or whatever. Otherwise, you need to care, take care about uh, you, your own like ETCD place somewhere else. So and case number two here as a Tesla case. So it's more actually usual situation than this one because in this case, you need to know how to cook that application server side issue like uh, SSRF in this case. So you just need to find that. So somebody just found Tesla Kubernetes instance place somewhere and plug in there using uh, uh, just uh, default credentials. It was just an insecure administrative console. So, and as a result of that, so that person compromised the entire Tesla infrastructure with a lot of data related to telemetrics and others, but we don't know what exactly was compromised there, but they mentioned at least telemetric data means all the data with the tracks and routes from every single car of Tesla, including like your own car if you're a Tesla owner there. Uh, which is bad, but this one actually, this issue uh, mainly related to like very old fashioned network security access control thing plus some sort of like Kubernetes misconfiguration plus default secrets. And this one is related to something more <coughs> unusual uh, application security things. And it's related to uh, also to that fact that you can technically run your own code at your Shopify instances to make your like e-commerce platform more cozy. So uh, that's why this issue happens there. So uh, if you have any questions related to that network policies, it's a really good time to read that. Otherwise I'll uh, keep going and final, to, to finally uh, explain application security aspects of APIs so, because nowadays we still work on this platform. So yeah, there are Two questions, actually. Okay. The first one um, is, can we have a namespace selector and a pod selector field coexist in a new pod? So uh, can I select yes, yes, yes. Name? Yes, we can do that. So we, we can do that name selector, uh, namespace selector and a pod selector field. Uh, but I guess that the best practice here is to apply that enforcement policies to, to, to avoid uh, like uh, that requirement. But yeah, uh, we can do that. So, and question number two. Uh, uh, yeah, like, what is the best mm -hmm. way to restrict access to the metadata API since network policy is a namespace resource and namespace credentials are usually shared with the developers, the ICD and so on. That's probably not a good idea. Uh, yeah, no, this is an easy answer. So, uh, actually, network policy is, is, is the best way there. So, even if it's shared, so with developers, so never mind. So, they will know that we, we restrict that access. You can also uh, implement like uh, some sort of like orchestration things like IP table zero. So you can also configure that at your EDCD uh, config. But if you are doing with this metadata API, so technically, uh, so cloud providers, uh, as I believe already restricted that. Uh, could you recommend a net asset ability to run CICD chain to check that on network policies and selector parts in place modified? Yes, I'll do that. So I'll explain the tool uh, uh, at the last part and the tool also will cover that. Perfect, that seems to be it. So let's go to okay. number four. So number four, it's a pod security policy. So sorry about it. I know that it's kind of usual stuff, but I just want to share some insights and new ideas here and then I'll cover application security, which is pretty unique. So uh, 
uh, pod security is pretty interesting stuff here. I love that. I mean, uh, first of all, it's some sort of like <coughs> object define a set of conditions that pod must run in order to accept into the system as well as defaults for the related build. I don't understand that. I mean, from my point of view, that pod security is kind of like all-in-one endpoint security management policies that includes SE Linux, App Armor, file system restrictions, Docker things like privileged containers, uh, uh, like CCTL um, blacklist, plus a comp, which is kind of sandbox there, plus additional other things added by Google. It's something like, uh, like, for example, you can like spend a year to understand how to cook SE Linux. And here it's just the pod security policies. I mean, they did a really good job to like pack everything together to one like pod security policy and say you to understand that. I mean, to understand how it's really work inside, you need to understand everything here. File system in details, Docker sync in details, sys controls there, sec comp, IRC Linux and App Armor. It's just impossible to explain what's under the roof, but I can explain four things uh, specifically made for Kubernetes by Google. First of all, it's a Docker related sync. It's a privileged container. Technically, it means that if you can do that with your pod, uh, your pod uh, will not able to take an access back to the host, technically their devices and um, network. So uh, specifically, it, it's enabled by default uh, and it's really good. So specifically, it means that you can prevent uh, some sort of like local privilege exploits uh, that allows Docker containers to compromise the host plus additional things there. So uh, as well as like uh, block devices and other devices that could be actually used uh, inside the container there. It's a good option there, mainly related to Docker. Number two here is just a root, uh, like read only root file system, which is good as well. It's mainly related to uh, like that fact that, so you can do that at like your graph, for example, if, you, if you're doing like Ordin Linux or so. Uh, it allows you to protect some some sort of data on um, on your apps on your pods uh, based on uh, like just read only file access, right? So you cannot put shells there or some other malicious things there, which is good. Uh, plus, you need to count that you need to create a temporary file system or so, which will actually allow you to to write files anyways. So must run as non root option. This is some sort of like truth of jail thing. So everything inside a pod should be uh, launched as a non-root, which is good. So it's definitely a useful thing there. And if you can build your uh, like infrastructure based on that and you can deliver apps uh, in this way, it will be super helpful to avoid pod exploitation. Plus the last thing here is allow privilege escalation. Uh, so you can set false here. It means that child process can take more privileges as parent. For example, you cannot use like utilities like pink or other utilities with sticky bits uh, from unprivileged users. So uh, it also allows you to uh, keep against uh, post exploitation sometimes. Plus you can also disable uh, just using that uh, privileged utilities uh, from, from your apps, which is useful stuff. But once again, it's just only four features implemented by Google. Plus you can control entire apps in Linux, entire app armor file system things and the blacklist for sys controls, which is, I mean, which is huge. It's just impossible to explain pod security policies in detail because to do that, I need to explain this, 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 and all the stuff there. That's why I just want to mention four things there and recommend you to use all of them. Plus take care about uh, usual thing like SL Linux. It's actually a good example why we can say, okay, I'm using like containers. I don't take care about like my apps as I did before with SL Linux or other like isolation or sandboxes. No, you should do that as well as it was before. But uh, nowadays you can control that uh, using that pod security policies to implement additional features. Uh, plus it can guarantee like uh, a better migration if uh, you did that uh, hydrating things before you can uh, run the same stuff and Kubernetes. Uh, so that's it. So four different links related to that. Once again, so the security context uh, you can define to use pod policies there. Uh, plus uh, this um, link number two is very useful to like put some, to understand that 
uh, four things plus put some more things there, plus Kubernetes Doc is pretty good and they described everything there. But once again, to be able to cook the pod policies in the right way, you need to be able to cook AppArmor and SL Linux and understand file system uh, at a like deep level plus Docker things uh, we described here, plus syscontrols, plus seccom, uh, which is actually uh, a really, really huge uh, knowledge. <laughs> Uh, anything related to that part? Um, doesn't seem like it, no? Amazingly. Yeah. I know why. Crazy. So, <coughs> point number four, five, point number five. So, the most useful stuff here, it's uh, audit policy. It's more related to like incident response uh, thing that can help you to uh, actually prevent data breach as a lot of people um, said me before but in effect it can so audit policy can help you to know about the data breach before attackers will able to for example download a lot of data like significant amount of data you can stop breaches uh, in real time using like audit policies and some sort of prevention tools as well so two different things here it's stages and levels so you know that it's no good thing here but anyway so stages it means that at which stage that particular uh, that particular, uh, at, which, at which stage of request processing at Kubernetes side, that particular um, uh, event will be triggered. You can do request received right after that fact uh, when uh, Kube received a request. Uh, response started when it just started to uh, send a re uh, response. Response complete and the response body has been completed at server side and panic event generated when a panic occurred. It means it's more, uh, uh, related to different errors and you can count that as like 500 for example responses or so and you can do different levels so none which is don't event don't log event that match the true metadata local request metadata request it means log event metadata and request body but not response body and request response it means that you will log everything there if you can log everything just do that you will actually understand what go, what's, what happens there but uh, I, I actually want to recommend you to store like at least a couple of days in request response way uh, if you can do more plus everything the rest uh, as a metadata request. So you can configure different timings with different like log levels which can help you to understand uh, your risks plus uh, deal with errors and deals with uh, incidents uh, with uh, like shorter period of time, but with detailed uh, data inside. So uh, what I want to recommend here, so Kubernetes, I mean, Google did really good job to uh, put a lot of um, notations and a lot of insight how to build locks in the right way. Just use the same way to log your own APIs and application lock. If you will do that, you will be able to achieve like unified lock systems there. So <laughs> it's not a big deal to ask your developers and create logs uh, based on your custom business logic logs or other logs you want to try, uh, you want to keep there at the same way. If you will do that, you will be able to either track, correlate, manage them together. And then inside here is like try to be as much closer to original Kubernetes log format as you only can in your apps as well. So and put them together, like do the same like stages, do the same levels there. So since Kubernetes itself is just a web app, you can apply an API, right? So you can apply the same model uh, of the audit policy uh, and log format there to your apps as well. And it definitely can help. So that's only one thing I need to mention. Log everything you can. If you have no enough of storage, do different period of times, do like request response for a relatively shorter period as a request there to store more data there and metadata for all the other logs for a year, for example. So if you can't uh, actually store everything uh, in, in a full. A uh, couple of links here. So I definitely recommend you to read the last one. It's a personal blog of that guy, no cubes. So uh, you can say, you can um, find some sort of like uh, receipts, how to cook that log system better. And so all the rest is mainly related to Google official docs, but I really like that one when Google actually explained how to debug application cluster in, in details.
Okay, so anything related to that part? Yes, there is one question which is, will it be possible to audit logs related to operations like deployments who did what something like that? Uh, so can you audit log operations like deployments who deployed it for example mm -hmm. so uh, uh yes yeah, definitely true uh, if you're doing any deployments in kubernetes so you uh during the deployment stages so your cluster will trigger the APIs and the Kubernetes APIs will be logged there. You can, you can log that. Uh, that's specifically for what this audit policy uh, was created there. So definitely all the time when you want, when your cluster will deploy new pod, for example, or so you, 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 everything there will be logged. If you want to apply more, for example, if you're using custom CICD syncs, and you, you example, deploying uh, like, I don't know, your own apps and then doing some kind of actions there and you would want to deploy that action. If we want to log that action, so you need to uh, log it by yourself. But in, in a general case, so you just can use that logs and it should be enough. Plus, uh, if you implemented everything during the deployment stage, uh, deployment stage in the right way, everything there would, uh, would be logged. So just avoid custom scripts there and use like a general deployment model Actually, it's a little bit like uh, it, it will be required uh, a little bit more than like 30 minutes to explain how to deploy apps in Kubernetes. It's not that thing, but definitely if you will do everything by that guides uh, provided by Google, you will be able to everything there and will be covered by that logs. So, right. um, and then what can be a target for log? So where can log audits send things to? Uh, yes, so sure, we can do uh, a lot of things there. You can install your own gray log uh, cluster and put data there. You can do uh, all the other storages. You can do in webhooks there. You can connect many sources there. So everything here covered by that link. So, but usually people do like the gray log, which is kind of like an open source log storage, but you can use also like commercial services or I uh, own way to store that. It's, it really depends, but usually it's just additional cluster of gray logs there. If you're using cloud, so you can just uh, buy that service there and connect it there and everything will be there. <laughs> and Amazon or Azure or uh, Google Cloud. Okay, let's do part number six. We're almost there. Prudential we can, uh, uh, sure. Uh, for all the people in the audience, please do put the questions into the Q&A sections because of, um, we can't do everything in chat and I will probably oversee things. So Q&A box, not. Okay. <coughs> so point number six, credentials uh, management policy. So this is something that you need to do by yourself. Kubernetes will never help you with that. So Kubernetes will provide you a lot of like capabilities there. You can use tokens, uh, uh, like open ID things or certificates. I prefer to recommend certificates only policies. Uh, it means that you need to issue a certificate for every single operation you need to do there, put some dates there, retain the certificates. In this case, we can achieve uh, three important results. First of all, uh, we can use any public key infrastructure management tools and products to manage the certificates, which is like old fashioned stuff, uh, a lot of products there uh, were invented. You can use them and uh, connect it to your IDM or so. Everything there already solved. So, uh, which I can't say uh, uh, about like just the key management stuff. I mean, token management stuff because. Somebody can just copy this token, forget the token some, somewhere, like put the token to GitHub. So it's, uh, we need to improve that uh, uh, from a security side and we will do that uh, in future definitely. But nowadays it's just more, much easier to use public key things and uh, issue certificates for every single action there. Uh, point number two here, that certificates only way will um, allow us to control that uh, period of time, so, right? So because uh, you cannot issue a certificate without like expiration date. So, I mean, you can, but still. 
So uh, you can put uh, expiration dates there and you will able to uh, guarantee that the certificate will not be valid after that date, which is also better than just like a plain, uh, in plain text token or secret. So plus you can use uh, object IDs uh, for additional attribute based features that leverage you can uh, apply additional logic there and future can connect it uh, once again to your uh, I don't know like IDM things you can do groups here based on that fact you can do a lot of things based on that certificate that's why I recommend to you that plus it's just not as easy as um, uh, it was with tokens to just copy and paste the certificate content somewhere I mean private key content certificates the public information there which is good plus you can store it better so a lot of benefits there uh, I know that it seems like old session way. I know that people would like to use something easier than certificates, but I highly recommend to use that uh, because of the three points we will never achieve using any uh, anything else there. Um, plus you can do it uh, for not only infrastructure credentials, but also for all the services uh, to make everything uh, in one unified way. I know that this is, uh, this is kind of like an ideal world. For example, you <laughs> one day you will be faced with an integration with custom API uh, of like third party provider with no certificates authentication there, but uh, use that as uh, like frequent as it's only possible. Plus you can do another one sync here as an encryption native support. Uh, Kubernetes since like uh, a couple of versions ago introduced new feature called in, uh, native encryption support. You can encrypt your tokens as it's stored at VTCD plus all the other data if you want to do that. And so it's, it, it, there's something like, uh, kind of like, uh, it's not a better version, but I never have that people use that uh, pretty widely, but you can try. And so if you want to, you can, again, follow that link and understand how it works there in effect. So you can just define that you want to encrypt the data and store keys somehow, but I don't like that way because Actually, uh, that keys uh, will be stored at the same uh, like storage as encrypted data, which I can't accept. So, uh, do you have any questions related to this? I can't actually recommend some sort of best practice instead of using those PKI management tools. And so, certificates only access policy plus rotate that uh, in the right way. And to do that, <coughs> it's a better way uh, to, to, to just implement certificate only access policy there. But it's uh, something that you need to decide by yourself how, how to implement it in the right way. And definitely IDM providers can help you that you need to understand like uh, on which uh, like main things your credential management policy will be based on. Uh, I want to recommend certificates only like basics. Let me check. No questions. questions. Yeah. Cool. So the last part and the most interesting part with the story is there. How it's relevant to application security. So we described six stages here, right? We described a lot of things, how to like protect this uh, Kubernetes cloud itself. And nowadays I want to explain how to, how it's relevant actually to application security. We can divide all the application security or uh, application specific vulnerabilities uh, in particular to two different things to two different parts, the server side things uh, that can <coughs> help attackers to get an access to pods and client side things that I can uh, help them to take an access to user data. So if we did everything right and like uh, points one and six, uh, so definitely we can mitigate the risk somehow. So, but bad news here is we need to implement everything in the right way, even if we will miss something, we can actually, um, help attackers to, to, to bypass like entire barrier of six points. So, and related to client side things, uh, technically audit policies may help to identify exploitation if we did that in the right way. And we can uh, like control every single piece of data there. But in effect, it's mainly related to application security itself than to Kubernetes security. Uh, in particular, if, if, because like if you have like um, like single page app or something that works with your APIs based on Kubernetes. So the single, uh, this uh, client side issues will be related to that part of single page app or JavaScript there itself and not related to Kubernetes 
anyhow at the first stage. So uh, some kind of insights I want to share. First of all, always use privilege Unix parts. It means that uh, you cannot open port from zero to consultant ranges three uh, with uh, non-root privileges. So it can help with over maybe an attack. I'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, disable TCP fast open inside Kubernetes things. A TCP fast open as a new, relatively new mechanism uh, invented at 2.6 kernel like seven years ago or so. Nowadays it's a kind of like default stuff. Uh, it helps um, attackers sometimes to uh, steal a token when from one AP address to another AP address and then keep that token and use that same token uh, uh, that time when a attacker like compromised pod uh, will be like uh, disabled or will change an AP address. So I'll explain that. Uh, File number three is run everything from non-root. We explained that and described how to do that using path security policies. Uh, another one is don't use post-based authentication. So never try to define some kind of like access controls using like host names, for example, or IP addresses or so. Uh, you can do that. Use tokens instead and authenticate everything in the proper way as we described, uh, as we discussed before. You need to check the code by like static source and dynamic tools there and implement something like API uh, protection solutions or uh, IPS ideas if they can do that at that level. Uh, you can do that as well because only in this case you can guarantee that you uh, actually know uh, when the thread started, how to mitigate the threat, so how to monitor that in the right way, uh, otherwise you will be just blind. So, um, so I want to actually explained two attack scenarios that we've seen in the real world and all of them were related to security audits. So, uh, but I can say that it wasn't wild. So scenario number one at uh, Kubernetes was related to that fact that like auditors find like a remote code execution in a Python app because of this like deserialization bug. Uh, so because developers just published some sort of service with a pickle data there and a pickle, technically, it's a, it's a code packed to like a screen readable way, right? Uh, and human readable way there. And so now it's, it's a binary format, sorry. So, and takers use that, uh, put some piece of like malicious data, run additional service, and then found that initial service uh, on the port was run an unprivileged port like 5001. And they, they did like self kill of that service, plus reopen that from, from additional process. And since it was like unprivileged port, it was happened. And then they just start to listen everything, every single like east west communications there and saw secrets from that services uh, who actually connected to that service and then do the same secrets to communicate with other services and API controllers, uh, API gateway using that secret, uh, which is uh, actually a common case that people just uh, prefer to use one secret per one service for all the operations. So um, for all the operations on um, their side all the time, which is a bad design definitely, but that's what they did. Like one RC plus one self queue plus port to open and there's a different process there, just then like traffic sniffing technically and that's it. So they technically run additional web server at that uh, at the same port as initial like compromised web server was run in a pod and then uh, just hold some sort of secrets there and data because of this east-west things and then just use that to, to uh, steal some data under the roof of that infrastructure, which is good. I mean, <laughs> it is really, a really good example of how it's uh, important to take care about not only like security of one pod, but uh, why it's really important to take care about entire security of entire infrastructure inside the cluster because uh, you'd never know which kind of targets attackers will be fine inside. And attack scenario number two here as was started with the same like deserialization bug but in a Ruby on Rails instead of Python. And then attackers found that so we actually can do something like that. We can uh, compromise a push-based 
publishing thing at API Gateway, and they just registered their service as another service at API Gateway. So they took an access to the pod, uh, were able to run the code there, and then sent a push request to API Gateway that register myself as a new service, for example, as an authentication service. And then they, uh, this API Gateway just uh, easily added that service to load balancers and then started to send login requests <laughs> for that service. And it happens all the time with uh, uh, microservices environments when uh, people forgot that technically you should not trust every single microservice inside uh, your infrastructure because, uh, and you cannot build uh, like network control only there, right? So because technically if that service will be compromised or port or just an API, uh, like process or application code will be compromised. It will be possible to send any requests uh, from that infrastructure um, unit to different units, including like API gateway. And that actually story can illustrate that very well. So sometimes like one service can register uh, themselves at an API gateway as another service, like authentication service, for example, and start to receive login and password requests. That's what happens there. So it's pretty uh, much everything I want to cover today. Uh, and I want to finish with uh, that good tool uh, that you can use to, to keep everything uh, and enforce everything we discussed before, definitely exclude an application security stuff because we need to do a lot of things here. Um, let me check if we have some questions here. Oh, we have questions here. Not directly. Um, yeah, right. I think mm -hmm. The last question we can answer for today is really also being related to security. How do technologies like GVisor and Kata containers could help Kubernetes security? <laughs> so uh, it's more like marketing question, I guess. <laughs> so, but uh, there is a lot of different so, uh, solution that can help with containers. And so to, to address that question, we need to take a look deeply at that technologies. But believe me, if you will implement everything here in the right way, so, and if you will able to manage that in the right way, uh, I believe that you will be good there. Plus uh, that particular products can also help against like exploitation of your apps. They can help at that stage, technically at that like application security stage. Uh, when something bad will happen here, they potentially can catch that before it will be possible to exploit that. But I believe that they will be blind against that kind of attack because they're pretty logical attacks there. Uh, but yeah, so they want to protect you against that level. I mean, find number seven here, application security thing there. Another question? Perfect. No, I think that's it. Um, everything we can do for today. So just maybe close it off. Um, and again, there will be your contact information on the slide. So people can definitely follow up if they have more questions. I yeah. think there is so, like yeah. five. So just feel free to contact you, I guess. Sure. So the last part, the last point I want to explain today, it's like how to change, how to keep everything remain and change. So that's exactly uh, what uh, somebody asked before about like enforcing things. So, uh, if we did everything we did only once, it will never guarantee our security. So to, to, to solve a problem, uh, in security problem, we need to solve that problem as a process problem. We need to build a process that. In particular for Kubernetes, it means that we need to check that YAML configs uh, all the time in the right way. And to do that, we can use some sort of open source tool, but I can I recommend Kubotit. And actually funny thing that that tool was made by the Shopify company that uh, actually got hacked, as we explained before, uh, because of the SSRF issues there. And they uh, actually invented that tool to technically protect themselves against things like this in the future, plus to help everybody else. Uh, it's an open source tool. You can download it there, and you can uh, do a lot of things there. They built and uh, they've built and some sort of like out of the box controls. We can define your own controls. We can define enforcement policies there. We can apply additional stuff. Uh, if you would like, to, if you wouldn't like to do that, you can just do your own YAML parser and enforce your own policies there, and uh, then apply that. So, but 
once again, you need to build this enforcement layer somewhere else of Kubernetes itself. So, which is kind of like, like uh, a narrow thing here, but that it, it is what it is, right? So it's more related to framework. And if you want to enforce something, you should do that outside of the framework and you have a lot of tools or you can do YAML, your own YAML parser or write a couple of scripts there, but Kubeaudit is really good. Uh, mainly because they did a lot of like built-in checks. So a couple of links, it's uh, GitHub Shopify Kubeaudit plus uh, Kubernetes uh, security cluster guide uh, where you can find like a lot of uh, other information how to do everything we discussed here in the right wing. Not everything, but like a lot of things there. So if you have any additional questions, just let me know. So you can write me directly in Twitter at uh, this is my Twitter name or uh, ask question at like one website or uh, uh, you can also uh, like look at our web uh, page to find some contacts here and we have the Slack channel uh, where you can ask questions in like a chat way if you prefer to. Perfect. Thanks, Ivan. Great presentation. All Thank right. You so much. Um, also, so because of time and people already dropping out, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, again, the webinar recording and slides will be online later today. Um, and yeah, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar from CNCF. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thanks everybody, bye.